Hey folks, Craig Danger, Vinyl Record Player. Ho! Today we are talking underrated debuts of 1974. Continuing my series, it really started in the 1960s, moving year by year through the 1970s. We've got five glorious picks. Very underrated albums, frankly, a few probably you've never even heard of. So please, safety first. Buckle up. And we're back. Uh, yeah, so going to hit five underrated debut LPs. I'm just basically going to get right into it. I'm telling you that these years are not entirely easy because there's not an incredible amount of debuts. There's an incredible amount of great music from bands that have kind of already been established. So as a result, you kind of got to dig deep if you want to find the underrated debuts, which is why, as an example, for 74, why am I not including Bad Company, Bad Company? It's rated, right? I'm not saying it's overrated. It's a great album. They're best. But uh, let's be honest, it's rated. So uh, let's just start out with, uh, with this one. How about, how about Bebop Deluxe's Axe Victim from 1974? Uh, this, of course, that is basically Bill Nelson. Uh, and early on, uh, starting in 72, they basically recorded this album. And as you can see on the back, we've got the band. Turns out this was not uh, Bebop Deluxe for very long, as a matter of fact. Uh, after about one tour, Pretty much all of these gentlemen, except of course uh, Bill, who is right here, uh, were fired from the band. And Bill Nelson basically hired an entirely new band. Really, frankly, there's a lot of sort of Bowie-esque vibes. This is, was obviously during the pop, more popular time for glam rock. And in fact, one of the reasons why Bill Nelson fired a lot of his band was frankly because it sounded everybody was complaining that they sounded a little bit too much like David Bowie. Is that necessarily the case? Mm, I think that's a reach, but you could almost say with the, with the kind of the mild accent and the style in general, you could almost say that Bill Nelson has some Bowie-esque sort of vibes to him. Absolutely. But this album is a really great taster. What I always find to be very interesting about Bill Nelson particularly and Bebop Deluxe, who did about three or four albums after this, all really good albums, and they also did a live album. One of the most interesting things about Bill Nelson is just that his guitar playing is fantastic. But what's really, really interesting is how much it's obvious that Bill Nelson influenced Prince. If you hear some of the solos on, uh, on, on these tracks, less so on this album, but as, as it progresses, you'll hear these solos and you'll be like, wait a sec, is that Prince? No, it's Bill Nelson. In fact, it's shocking when you hear some of that 80s material by Prince, how almost note for note in places, Bill Nelson seems to appear and disappear. But uh, again, it's a really good album. Uh, is it their best album? No, uh, by no means. Obviously, Bill fired the whole band. He, he fired the whole band. That doesn't mean it's not a quality album, and I, I would definitely say that it's underrated. Uh, like I say, very glammy, but at the same time, a little bit progressive, not progressive in a yes style, but uh, progressive. For the time. But anyway, uh, Bebop Deluxe Axe Victim from 1974, a definite underrated de debut, and uh, like I say, definitely worth a pickup, always. And I just wanted to say uh, like, subscribe, but also I just want to thank everybody who has been liking and subscribing recently. It's been pretty fantastic. Channel's grown in a clip, uh, which is kind of good. I've been at this for about a year and a half now. It's good to see that uh, finally. Craig Danger is paying a little, getting a little bit of pay dirt on this uh, thing. So again, thanks to everyone who likes and subscribes. Number two, this one I actually do not have a physical copy of, but I kind of fell in love with this band going back a uh, few years. There was a, a great channel on the YouTube whereby basically they had all these old episodes of a television, a British television show called the old gray whistle test now if you're north american you're probably like i am now what are you talking about what are you the old gray whistle test was effectively sort of like an alternative midnight special like a british sort of midnight special uh going back in the early 70s hosted by a gentleman named whispering bob harris who is always a delight he's heard a total like this i'm whispering bob harris hello 
and, and very, very low tones. At any rate, this band, Wally. Wally uh, was basically a, a band from Northern England. They did a little bit of a contest, a best new act contest. They did not win, but they were in second place, and they actually caught the eye of the old Grey Whistle Tests host, Whisper and Bob, and basically they recorded this album. And what I'm going to do is I'll put a link to the actual old Grey Whistle Test footage that I managed to find on the YouTube. Who knows how long that's going to be there. Again, these things are all under copyright with the BBC, so any anything can happen. But Wally, very interesting band, certainly. Uh, basically, this album, their debut, Wally, the self-titled, was produced by Bob Harris and Rick Wakeman, actually, of Yes. So there are tinges of sort of prog, but there's also elements of kind of almost gypsy music. And that definitely you can tell when you listen to the clip that I've included called Sunday Walking Lady, wherein there's sort of a breakdown after the start uh, of the track where it turns into almost sort of like a gypsy, sort of a jigging thing in a good way, if that's, and that's very possible. It's more than possible, friends. It, it is in a good way. Uh, but like I say, Sunday Walking Lady kind of has an America vibe, some really great harmonizing. And in, in fact, the harmonizing is going throughout the album. Uh, it's a really, really good record. I don't know that I'll ever have a physical copy of Wally. I'm pretty sure this was never released in uh, the in North America. It was certainly released in Britain. But Wally, basically what happened with them is they had like a second album, didn't really record much. They did some touring, they did open for Yes, and, were, and they were managed by the same gentleman who also managed Yes, and at the same time they, they unfortunately kind of went nowhere. But again, Wally, particularly Sunday Walking Lady, but the whole album is actually very good. And if you're into prog, if you're into like really nice harmonies, then Wally would be a definite, underrated, if not practically unknown debut from 1974. Coming up next, I mean, you know, I have to say, this this one is, I just recently picked this one up. I, I consider it a bit of a grail. This is uh, Gwen McRae's rocking chair. Now, this is effectively, basically just Gwen McRae, Gwen McRae on the cat label, uh, which is, of course, this, uh, released in, of course, 1974. This particular copy would be from 75. When Gwen released what? How about Rock and Chair? Which, again, I'm not going to pronounce, but I will, that in fact, it, it may be the sexiest song ever produced. Deuce, deuce. The sexiest song ever produced. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion. I mean, I, I just, I can't even, I don't even know what to say. Gwen McRae's Rock and Chair, obviously, Huge hit, went to number nine on the Billboard charts, was an answer song to her husband, George McRae, uh, who uh, a year before released the song Rock Me Baby. So this is basically Gwen McRae, Gwen McRae with Rock and Chair, uh, sort of tacked on to the beginning of it. But you know what? I was listening to this album last night, and you know what? Cover to cover, except maybe for the, the last track. He don't, he don't, ever lose his groove. Well, kind of lost his groove on this one. That's kind of the soul duff track on, on this really remarkable album. This is uh, Miami Soul, produced by Steve Alamo. No idea who that is. But the key on this one is you're, you're getting, of course, Clarence Reed, magical writer uh, for the Miami Soul scene. He was, of course, on the, the TK label, the Cat label, and also the Alston label. He wrote for Betty Wright as well. But you know what? This one is just an amazing album, chock full of basically hip-hop samples. If you're a fan of hip-hop, you know many, many of the grooves on, on this particular record. But again, this is such a great record. You know what? This is not on streaming. Uh, I do not know what's going on with the rights for this particular record. Desperately needs a repress. Uh, this, of course, is, is the, uh, the Cat label. I'm going to say, honestly, the Cat label... Oh, I've got two records on the Cat label. Both of them are not the best presses I've ever had. Uh, a, little, a, little bit of, a little bit of weirdness going on with the presses, and that's obviously all, always going to be a potential problem, but it seems like with the Cat, two Cat records that I have, ugh, not the best sounding overall. Most of the album, of course, are good, but there are some parts where you're like, oh, that sounds like 
bad pressing. Does not matter with Gwen McRae's rocking chair. Also, Gwen McRae, Gwen McRae from 1974, uh, which is, again, a banging album. Also features, of course, the guitar playing of the illustrious Willie Clark, also known as Little Beaver. Uh, Little Beaver, I mean, I've always said everybody needs Little Beaver in their life. But uh, the fact is, is, ooh, you want to talk about a groove merchant? Little Beaver, an, another artist to look up. He is uh, absolutely a fantastic player and really responsible. Co-wrote Rockin' Chair, which again, went to number nine. And again, the sexiest song ever. Yes, Craig Danger has pronounced it. The sexiest song ever. So yeah, uh, Gwen McRae, Rockin' Chair, classic LP. 1974, her debut, basically uh, not easy to find, but if you do see this one, please, you do yourself a favor, pick that one up. Next up, oh, we're, we're going into some more. So how about, how about GC Cameron? One of my favorites, of course, White Suits, and we know that White Suits are, as always, the new black tuxedo. But uh, GC Cameron, Love Songs and Other Tragedies, his debut from 1974. Little backstory on GC. He basically was, uh, went to Vietnam, uh, fought, came back, joined the Spinners, and uh, of course was actually the singer on one of their big hits, one of their big early hits, It's a Shame, and then basically kind of broke with the band. And in 1974, Motown actually, this is of course on the Motown label, Motown actually went full force trying to pr promote uh, GC, and in fact had Willie Hutch producing on this record, as well as just a uh, sort of a cavalcade of very high quality Motown producers, including Frank Wilson, who uh, was kind of one of the main staff producers at the time, produced Gladys Knight and the Pips, produced uh, a little bit of Four Tops earlier on. And then of course you got Willie Hutch. And then who else? How about Stevie Wonder? Stevie Wonder and Willie Hutch, both writing and arranging and producing on this particular album. It really, in my opinion, is kind of one of his best, uh, if not his best. And again, I mean, can you really doubt that that white suit? I can't. Uh, I look at this suit, I think, I must buy this album. This album, oh, oh, and there's a confident man on the back in a white suit. Why? White suit, the new black tuxedo. But at any rate, uh, GC went on to record about three or four more albums for Motown. But again, this one kind of remains the crown jewel. Unfortunately, sold just about nothing. And uh, that was unfortunate because, again, it's a really, really good record and super underrated. So, uh, yeah, GC Cameron, Love Songs and Other Tragedies, a super underrated debut from 1974. And we'll end it off with uh, this one. Ooh, picked this one up from, uh, uh, basically, I got the idea from a gentleman called The Mellow Man, Lawrence, who basically... Uh, Big up this record, Just You and Me by J.R. Bailey. And I know what you're thinking right away. You're thinking, uh, Craig, Craig Danger, well, what's going on with this cover art? Hey, I don't, uh, I don't select these for the cover art, thankfully. I, it's actually, this record, though, is absolutely fantastic. I've, I've kind of described it as a combination of Marvin Gaye, Curtis Mayfield, maybe a little Donny Hathaway in there. This is just a really immense and amazingly large record. Super surprising to me. Uh, just how excellent this album is and while selling probably about zero copies. Unfortunately, this would really be his only album. I, he may have put out something a little bit a couple of years later. J.R. Bailey was basically a songwriter and in a songwriting partnership, he actually wrote uh, Everybody Plays the Fool by uh, the main ingredient, as a matter of fact. That's kind of his big claim to fame. But ooh, it should be uh, Me and You uh, by J.R. Bailey. This is really a really great record. Very sort of big, expansive, a little bit of consciousness, sort of uh, what's going on vibes coming off of this record. But yeah, a really fantastic one. And frankly, again, a giantly underrated debut LP from 1974. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what we've got. Again, like and subscribe. Uh, I like to... Thank everyone who has, of course, liked and subscribed recently. I've just Things have been getting a lot better at the channel. I'm, I'm uh, quite excited about bringing you, obviously, more of these fantastic music videos. So uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see you on the next one.